Hello and welcome to this multi-part celebration of Doctor Who's very first An Unearthly Child, which is being given the Happy Times and Places treatment. I have watched it and I've chosen my five favourite things about that particular episode and now I've got loads of special guests to tell me their five favourite things. Hello, greetings to all the listeners of Happy Times and Places as we celebrate the 60th anniversary of the first episode of Classic Doctor Who. Well, isn't that exciting? So, happy birthday to the first unearthly child, Susan Foreman, from the second unearthly child, Adric, and all of you. Cheers. Bye. Hello, this is Nicola Bryant, and I'm saying welcome to Happy Times and Places with Toby Hayduk. How lovely that you are here. And happy birthday, Doctor Who. Now, Doctor, you can get a bus pass. And you won't need to take the TARDIS. You can travel for free on uh, the underground. And um, you won't need to worry if the TARDIS plays up. So I hope you'll enjoy that. And um, congratulations, you are now really old. She doesn't look it, I tell you. Now, I've nearly got you a companion greeting from every era. Will I manage to complete the set? Future episodes will tell you. Now, we can't not bring Doctor Who's classic era full circle as we do this. Jim Sankster, you heard as my first guest, did the Cavemen story, the first Doctor Who story. And the last Doctor Who story of the classic era, Survival, was chosen for happy times and places by somebody who has been very important to the modern iteration of the show chronicling it uh, and being a very very important part of fan culture but also professional writing and he has actually done an introduction himself he's far better at this podcasting and making things malarkey than I am. He's a YouTuber of great repute, but also journalist, writer, um, far too cool, funky and sexy to be anywhere near my orbit, and yet has descended upon us with great enthusiasm, even though he's extraordinarily busy. I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, Toby, and listeners to Toby's podcast, of which... I am still one. I love these podcasts. Thank you so much for having me back on. Uh, My name is Benjamin Cook. I am a writer for Doctor Who magazine and an editor of all sorts of things, including The Daleks in Colour, which is on BBC4 at 7.30pm on the 23rd of November, which I think is the day this podcast is released. Obviously, if you only have time to enjoy one 60th anniversary Doctor Who day treat, make it this podcast, if you can squeeze in a second, Go and watch the Daleks on BBC4. Thought I'd get that plug in there, Toby. Last time I was on your Happy Times and Places podcast, I chose my favourite things about the very last classic Doctor Who serial, Sylvester McCoy's Survival, which is now what I'm going to call it. Sylvester McCoy's Survival. This time I'm going to be choosing my favourite things about William Hartnell's An Unearthly Child, which I think makes me the only one of your guests to choose favourite things about both the last and the first classic episodes of Doctor Who. So I'm feeling very special. I'm bestriding eras. I'm the William Russell or Bonnie Langford of your podcast. So here we go. This is it. My five favourite things, five, about an unearthly child. Ah, that, uh, what a lovely introduction. And he is indeed, uh, he is indeed the, uh, the, the person who has done, uh, that the first and the last and how kind of him to say you should listen to this uh, uh, over and above his great effort I, I'm, I'm I'm thrilled that we have someone you know because because you know I, I'm all about looking back aren't I in these podcasts I'm, I'm thrilled that we can tie this in with something that is happening because this is being released on the 23rd of November whenever you're listening to it if you didn't listen to it straight away um, if, if you have thank you so much and yes let's throw forward to what's happening later tonight the Daleks in colour. Well, uh, Ben, you know, played a huge and important um, part of that. It's his baby. It's his project. Uh, and he also, you know, wrote The Writer's Tale with Russell T. Davis. So, you know, 
that's two really important uh, works that will stand the test of time one of them that hasn't been on yet i've seen a clip it looks very exciting i think it's an absolutely fantastic project and i can't wait to see what they've done it's great that somebody as knowledgeable and smart as ben uh has been the person who's been doing it so yeah plug that's a plug for what's coming up now let's see what ben has to say looking back. In at number one, my first favourite thing, well it would be remiss of me not to choose this because when I was doing my happy times and places on survival, one of them was the title of your podcast, Happy Times and Places. It was the time and place in which survival was set. I said back then that survival is set in what's tangibly the real world, which because New Who does that all the time, I think we forget how rare that is for the classic show. There is, I said, a real thrill to seeing the Doctor and Ace wandering around suburbia, or what you described as the urban sprawl, on a sunny Sunday afternoon and seeing them visit a corner shop and a youth centre and a council estate. 20th century Doctor Who tended not to do that sort of thing. And an earthly child did it, I said, last time I was on your podcast. And survival did it, I added. Survival returned to modern-day London, or what was then modern-day London, for one of the first times since An Unearthly Child. There were very few stories in between that did it. The War Machines sort of did, the TARDIS landing in a lay-by in Legopolis, but very few others. So, considering that I drew that parallel last time I was on your podcast between survival and an unearthly child's real-world contemporary setting, it would be insane of me not to do that again. Just as in survival, the Doctor and Ace are thrown into the real world, an unearthly child, in one of the smartest moves in the show's history, opens in a school, a comprehensive school, what's tangibly the real world. It isn't quite the urban sprawl of survival, since they were shooting in a tiny, dusty corner of Lime Grove Studio D, but it is a setting that most kids watching would instantly recognise. It's not even a boarding school or a Mallory Towers-type establishment. It's what my mum would call a bog-standard comprehensive, and she's allowed to call it that because she worked in one. Millions of kids would have come home from school on the Friday night, heard the news that President Kennedy had been shot, then the next day would have watched An Unearthly Child with its modern-day, what was then modern-day, school corridors and classrooms and Miss Wright and Mr Chesterton and popular beat combos in the hit parade. And even the policemen up top and the junkyard in Act 2 are recognisable things you'd see on your way home from school. This is real life. Then they'd be whisked off into the TARDIS, kidnapped, off on adventures, and they'd go back into a school like that on Monday morning, with teachers like Miss Wright and Mr Chesterton, and in the corner a kooky girl like Susan. It was Doctor Who doing what Doctor Who does best, showing us from our earliest years that there's magic and wonder and adventure lurking around any corner of our boring old contemporary lives. And I'll make my other favourite things shorter, I promise. Ha! Ah, oh, brilliant. Well, I love the fact that... Again, if I'd been asked to be on this podcast, you know, I've got, I've got an email from a tedious git like me, and go, can you be on my podcast again? Because that's how I think I sound to people. Um, I'd have just gone, all right, what can I think of off the top of my head? I'll record it into my iPhone and send it out. Ben's really thought about the last time he was on this show, and he's thought about the connection between the last story that he did for me which was the last story and the last episode of classic doctor Who, and he's tying it in with the first i love the thought that people are putting into this for this silly project i i've i'm you know i'm very touched by that and uh, and the effort that people are putting in on somebody else's behalf in order to make this interesting for you and uh, and worthwhile for me to do so thank you for that ben uh and thank you for inspiring those sorts of people and those sorts of responses, Doctor Who. Um, and isn't that nice? Yeah, that, that, and in fact, it's made me think, and of course, Ro- you know, Rose comes back in contemporary London as well. Uh, and, and it makes me think that if, if the person who's going to eventually be the showrunner that destroys Doctor Who uh, is listening to this, if you're a, you know, a fledgling fan or, uh, you, you, you know, you, you're actually the showrunner now and part of your showrunning job is to listen to obscure podcasts from the history of Doctor Who, whatever. If you're going to write the episode that ends Doctor Who, you really have to set it in modern day London, just so that the bookends are all, uh, you know, all match in a, sh- you know, in a show that largely doesn't match we need that really (laughs) good point ben what is his favorite thing number two number two 
I'm choosing one moment, one line in particular, one word. When Ian and Barbara break into I.M. Foreman's junkyard and discover that police box humming with life and the doctor catches them at it, what are you doing here? And Ian threatens to go and fetch a policeman. The doctor's like, I'm not stopping you. I'm not hindering you. If you want to make fools of yourselves. If you both want to make fools of yourselves, I suggest you... And then, I swear, he looks right at us. He breaks the fourth wall, looks out of the television and speaks directly to us. I suggest you do what you said you'd do. I suggest you do what you said you'd do. He's almost winking at us. Go and find a policeman. And go and find a policeman. Never mind the Feast of Stephen. Bill was breaking the fourth wall from episode one, letting us in on what he really thinks of meddlesome Mr Chesterfield and his accomplice, Miss Wright. Then Ian says, while you nip off quietly in the other direction... While you nip off quietly in the other direction... There's a beat. Insulting. And the Doctor, with Hartnell's perfect comic timing, just goes, insulting. 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 It makes me laugh every time. Insulting. One word cracks me up. My favourite thing. Insulting. <laughs> it, is, it is good, actually. Uh, and and because it's, you know, he's sort of saying it to himself as well. And I think I mentioned during the commentary that, you know, Hartnell does that stuff, which, you know, you wouldn't really do so much today. Um, but, but is you know, is a stage technique and, and wouldn't have seemed particularly weird to, to viewers at the time. And again, it helps to give to root that show in a sort of slightly mythical quality because it has those occasionally archaic things. And it is a great exchange. Uh, and, yeah, uh, and, and I, I, I've talked about it dur- during the commentary and uh, uh, Ben adds layers to it there. Um, and, I've, and I'm tickled by his his repeated uh, dropping of uh, not saying insulting into, into his... He's put a lot of effort into this. I'm very grateful. In at number three, the title. An Unearthly Child. I'm choosing, my third favourite thing is the title. Because, like us, Toby, it has aged like a fine wine. My theory about Doctor Who is, one of my theories, today's theory, is that there are only about a dozen or so really good Doctor Who episode titles, or story titles. Most of them are just okay. Some of them are terrible. The Android Invasion, obviously. The Deadly Assassin, definitely. The Wheel in Space. The Keys of Marinus. The Invasion. They weren't even trying with that one. But An Unearthly Child is a cracking title. It's scary and weird and mysterious and unearthly. And when I say it's aged well, I know that that title is supposed to be referring to Susan. That's who they meant when they named the episode An Unearthly Child. But watching it now, 60 years on, We know that the Doctor may look like an old man, but he is young. Younger than we'll ever see him again. Except for the fugitive Doctor, possibly. And that kid in Listen. And the fancy-dressed Bonanza in The Brain of Morbius. The BBC costume department should have known better than to hire a photo booth for their 1975 Christmas party. But no, the Hartnell Doctor, it now turns out, was a young man. A young Time Lord. He's a kid. In those early years, the Doctor is but a child who's not of this earth. He's an unearthly child. That titular character isn't Susan. The unearthly child of the title, it's the Doctor. That's my theory. I'm sticking to it. Next! Ho, 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 ho. Well, controversial. And, I mean, and wrong. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, and isn't it wonderful? Because there would have been a time when somebody advanced a theory like that. I'd have got really furious. Uh, and now, I. It's of course, it's fine. It's it doesn't affect the way I think about Doctor Who. And I know that Ben's not being entirely serious. I hope Ben is not being entirely serious. Um, but of course, uh, uh, it's a, it's an amusing illustration of, you know, his real point, which is that it is a beautiful title. It is a beautiful title. And um, he's right. There aren't there aren't an awful lot of really good titles for Doctor Who stories. But uh, um an unearthly child is one of them. I like Jim's observation that it's the, it's the indefinite article that does it, uh, slightly more than than Ben's f- massive fiction that it refers to the Doctor. But of course, if you want it to, it can, and it doesn't affect what any of us else do. And Ben is, of course, poking the tiger. Is it you poke poke the tiger, and uh, or he's just you know trying to cork the fine wine that he suggested <laughs> and I don't mind being a fine wine uh, 
so, and it, but he said both of us were like a fine wine. Ben is much younger than me, and uh, and uh, will I suspect age somewhat better. His genes are slightly better than mine. Anyway, number four. Number four. In at number four, my favourite thing, Waris Hussein. The history of Doctor Who is littered with people who came in, did a job, did that job so well that they literally made TV history, and then they left. They moved on to other things. And Waris was one of the very first to do that. In Warris's long, illustrious career, Doctor Who is just four episodes. Bish, bash, bosh. Then nine weeks off, then back on for seven more. Marco Polo, whatever happened to that. And then that's it. Off he went again, but this time forever. Off to do other amazing things and to live a full, incredible life, but leaving in his wake some of the most important, influential television ever made. For three months in the 60s, that's what Warris did. Then he moved on. And I'm simplifying things a bit because I know there's a lot of pre-production and some post-production. And he was a staff director at the BBC, wasn't he, I think, so it's not as though he wasn't still in the building. But it's so easy, too easy, I think, to reduce the work and the lives of the people who made, who make our favourite TV show to their contributions to that show only and nothing else. And to forget how lucky we are that so many of the people just passing through, working on Doctor Who for a few weeks or months, they're moving on. It's easy to overlook how lucky we are that so many of them didn't treat Doctor Who like just another job, just another gig. They cared. They fought for the show. They gave it their everything. War is shot in an earthly child twice. They made him go back and do it again. Lesser men would have quit. And his direction is first rate, genuinely dynamic. That opening shot of an unearthly child, which is still, to this day, one of Doctor Who's longest ever one-take continuous shots, is one of my absolute favourites. Warris is setting out his stall. He is not going to do things by halves on Doctor Who. Doctor Who is so, so lucky to have had Warris directing those first episodes, that first one in particular. We're so blessed that he cared so much. Yeah, we are. And what I like uh, particularly about Warris, I mean, apart from his work, and, and, and also he still remains slightly mysterious, even though we're very familiar with him because he's given interviews and even been played on screen as, as part of an adventure in space and time and everything like that, uh, is that we don't have Marco Polo. So we actually only have that first story. Uh, but, you know, he has the trademark revolving camera and I think he's brilliant at menace and atmosphere and all of that stuff. Uh, and he then went, you know, when I was young, he was that one that went off to America. He was, you know, we'd probably never hear from him again because he went off. And then there was, oh, you know, they, they uh, were going to ask him to do. John Nathan Turner wanted to ask him to do the five doctors, but there was no way he would do that. He was Warris Hussain. You know, so he was like, well, so then when Doctor Who magazine interviewed him, I was like, oh, wow, really? So he's he's prepared to talk about Doctor Who. He's Warris Hussain. Whereas now, of course, you know, he, we, we've been lucky enough to, to have many, many interviews with him and I've been lucky enough to, to encounter him um, and uh, not just through Doc 2 stuff either I once sat behind him at the was it at the Almeida Theatre yeah it was in a production of Measure for Measure the day before Matt Smith made his debut it was like Doc 2 Doctor Who follows me about you know it's all about me um, <laughs> but but I'm really pleased that uh, not just for Warris's place in the history of the show um, but because he is an important ingredient to the success of that first episode, one of the main... Re and I didn't choose him because I was sort of choosing by instinct and as things came into my head. Um, Warris is vital to the success of that first show. And if he hadn't directed that first episode, who knows what we would have got and, and what kind of show we would have got. Uh, and, and his legacy is is the continued success of the show. And I'm, I'm glad that he's associated with it. And I'm glad that somebody in this podcast has chosen him because he's very special. He's very skilled, very gifted. But I also like the way that Ben has framed that, that, yeah, and outside of those three months, he has had a life and a career and done loads of other really interesting things too. Um, and we will know about those because of Doctor Who in a way. Now, that's unfair and wrong in many ways, but that Doctor Who has probably outlasted in the public consciousness, you know, some of his better, in inverted commas, more illustrious work. But that doesn't matter. Actually, that doesn't matter because what who says what's better anyway? Um, what's You know, if you've made something that has had the effect on people that Doctor Who has had, oh boy, that's good. Even if Doctor Who was, you know, a silly kids programme for a Saturday tea time. 
uh, it it has become more than that. Um, but aside from all of that, he is a very very talented director, and uh, very very lucky to have him as the first one. Ben's final thing. Number five, my fifth final favourite thing, perhaps my most favourite thing about an unearthly child is that it exists. The BBC had an unfortunate habit of destroying a whole tonne of 1960s Doctor Who. And quite understandably, we mourn the loss of some of the classics that we'll never get to see. The Power of the Daleks, Fury from the Deep, The Feast of Stephen, The Tenth Planet Part Four. But imagine, just imagine if An Unearthly Child was a missing episode. It would be one of the most sought-after missing episodes of television ever. One of the most sought-after cultural artefacts ever. The Holy Grail. There would be an unearthly child-shaped hole in our shared cultural history. It would be the stuff of legend. Would telesnaps exist? Let's say no. And no pilot recording either. For this hypothetical, the pilot doesn't exist either. The darkest timeline. But no, how fortunate are we that An Unearthly Child, one of the most significant pieces of television ever made, exists. We can watch it and watch it again whenever we like. We can. We can find it. It's really worth reminding ourselves of how wonderful that is, especially now, especially this month, because there's been some hoo-ha recently about An Unearthly Child not being as available or as accessible as the other 800 or so episodes of Doctor Who currently on iPlayer. Understandably, some people are upset at An Unearthly Child's curious absence, and it is a shame, but don't be upset. It's out there, you can find it, An Unearthly Child is safe. Thank good God that the Doc 2 production team lent out the 10th Planet Episode 4 to Blue Peter, who then mislaid it, instead of an unearthly child. Give me an unearthly child over the Myth Makers or the Macra Terra any day of the week. How lucky are we? Toby, thank you for inviting me back onto your podcast to talk at you for what must seem like 60 years. I hope you can edit this down or some of it's useful. Happy birthday, Doctor Who. Happy times and places, Toby. Goodbye. Not editing a word, Ben. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Uh, you flatter me with your presence on this podcast, your much cooler presence. Uh, and I'm thrilled that he's a listener to this old oh, nonsense. Warms my old cockles. Now, uh, the fact that it exists, yeah, I mean, would a universe without an unearthly child scarcely bears thinking about and yes we're so lucky it exists for us twice well two and a half times um but i mean that's a miracle in a way isn't it that's a miracle that uh that that, that we have it in the you know so much 60s television that is not as well re represented as doctor at all much as i still feel the loss of those 97 missing episodes but we've always had an unearthly child I wonder if it would have been better if we'd lost it for a bit and then found it. And that would, what a day that would have been. But so as not to risk it, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty keen on it always being there. So let's not, let's not, let's not fiddle with that timeline in case it, you know, it gets mislaid on its way back from Ni Nigeria or wherever it turns up. Let's, I don't even want to go there. We'll always have an unearthly child. We always have had. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, thanks so much to Ben. I mean, he doesn't need my help plugging his work, but uh, if you've not read the writer's tale, yeah, uh, you you really should. Uh, it's it's I think it's, it's the best book written about Doctor Who, uh, and there's some bloody good Doctor Who books out there. Um, I've already mentioned uh, Doctor Who in early years from from much earlier in uh, in in, uh, in in the Doctor Who book range's existence, but there's there's loads of damn good books about Doctor Who. But I think. I think it's very hard to beat the writer's tale and also hard to beat Ben's interview with Clive Swift in Doctor Who magazine, but for very different reasons. Ah, I'm flattered Ben has taken part. Um, but, you know, Ben is not the only fan that uh, has been interviewed for this 60th anniversary podcast. So let's go uh, to someone else. <laughs> Just to let you into a little secret, this is turning out to be a slightly longer endeavour than I had anticipated. So as I'm recording, I don't know if this is going to be split into multi-episodes or what. However, 
at this juncture, I think it's, you know, it's lovely. We've heard from a load of Doctor Who fans, many of whom have connections with the show, you know, with the wider media of the show and, uh, you know, you know, big aspects of the show from publications to events to, uh, to some, you know, more subtle uh, offshoots that keep the programme out there. Uh, all very welcome guests, all very smart, kind people, as you've heard. But I think it's about time we heard from somebody who's worked on your actual Doctor Who, your actual classic Doctor Who, but is still a fan. It's got to be somebody who knows who knows what an unearthly child is and knows it well enough to choose good things about it. So um, how about the sort of first... The, the first person who I've associated with being a fan with also having their name on the credits of Doctor Who and of, and of jumping that gulf between being an aficionado and being a, being a purveyor of this wonderful programme. This is Andrew Smith with my f- uh, five favourite things from An Unearthly Child. And getting right into it, number one is... The music that's playing on Susan's radio when we first see her, listening to a transistor radio, making those exotic hand gestures. It's Three Guitars Mood 2 by Derek Nelson and Arthur Raymond. It's a lovely piece of music and it's so evocative of the time. It reminds me of groups like The Shadows. It's my favourite track on the 50th anniversary album. I could play it on a loop and indeed I have done. Haha, <laughs> good choice. Andrew uh, needs no introduction, but... Um... Uh, he is uh, going to be introduced by me now anyway, because he is, of course, the writer of the four-part Doctor Who story, Full Circle, and also prolific, described now for Big Finish, having spent the interim being a serving police officer of uh, of, of uh, at quite a high end of uh, his profession by the time he retired. I consider Andrew a friend, having met him. Well, he contacted me via Twitter first, I think, and then came to see my show, and uh, he's, a, he's a good man, and I very much enjoy his... His company, um, so yeah, three guitars move to it's uh, the 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 Arthur Nelson group. Well, it's it's actually it's Johnny Arthie, isn't it? Uh, not Arthur, but well, look, uh, listen to too much information, uh, which tells you all about the composition of uh, the the group that played the composition that you just heard. Uh, and all is not necessarily as it seems, all is not necessarily as it has been written up. And I found out a little bit about um, some of the people involved, because that's where I like to delve. Remember, I wrote to the son of the guy from the post office who uh, did some Dalek voice tests for Christopher Barry before the show had even begun, because I like the people, uh, including uh, uh, Andrew, who has chosen... Yeah, I love that piece of music too. I think it's really good. <laughs> I mean, it's... It, uh, uh, and I love that it's, you know, it's it has this claim to fame as being in the first episode of Doctor Who. And then, you know, as you go on later in life, you go, oh, well, I wonder what that's called. Oh, and Dwas had, Dwas had released it on a cassette with lots of other stock music. And uh, and then you find out, you know, who the people were that did it and find out that it was in other things as well. And it will it will live forever as uh, as the ditty that made Susan dance. Three guitars, mood two. Uh, well, Mood 2 is clearly a good one. And moving on, the number two is... Uh, my second favourite thing is when Susan says that uh, she'd thought Britain was on the decimal system. She's got this wrong in a in a lesson at, at school. Um, Britain is on pound, shillings and pence in 1963. And she said, oh, I thought we were on the decimal system. What I like about it is it's now prescient uh, it was future looking at the time but now it's very prescient because of course the country did move on to the decimal system in february 1971 i remember it well um uh so so yeah it's just how it, how it sounds now with a from this time as opposed to how it would have sounded at the time it fits in very nicely yeah, and I always liked that when, when in the dark days when Doctor Who was, you know, considered a joke, it would I would often flourish. Oh, but it was very prophetic because uh, if if you are a, if you're a fan of something and you like it, you you need it to score, you know, you need it to score bonus points wherever you can. And well, they predicted things that were actually going to happen was was pretty much you know high end currency uh, in uh, in that particular uh, sort of argument or that 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 particular um, sort of 
discussional landscape, if you like. you will be able to go, well, uh, they, 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 they predicted a female prime minister and the decimal system, don't you know? Uh, that's g- good. Why, why, why is that good? I mean, it's, good, it's bound to get some things right if it's dealing with the future. It's just good, right? It's one of the good things about the thing you're saying, as Wobbly said, it's not very good acting. It was, it was good because they were psychic <laughs> but i do like it and uh, whenever it happens i do uh, i have that little bit of you know that reminder of oh yeah that was always something where I went, yeah that, well that, that they turned out to be correct and that was actually before before they actually had the decimal currency you know um so <laughs> yeah i like that too um uh, although as yeah it is less valuable currency now because fortunately we don't uh, live in uh, live in a world where a doctor who fan has to be defensive all the time or maybe I've just changed and I don't feel the need to be defensive all the time. Either way, that is a good development, uh, either on just a personal or, uh, a, you know, totally wider cultural level. Hooray for that. What a good day. For my third choice, uh, there are a lot of firsts in this episode. Of course there are, and any and all of which could have been among my favourites, but I've limited myself to just this one. It's not the first sight of the TARDIS or the naming of the TARDIS, not the first sight of the Doctor. Um or even the first TARDIS journey, which which is quite striking, it, but it's or the first use of the title music or the title graphics. I'm sure people have chosen these, but my uh, first that I'm going to put among my favourites is that first entry into the TARDIS, the reveal of the TARDIS, when Barbara rushes in and we see the control room for the first time, and it makes such an impact. It doesn't matter how many times you've seen the episode, it makes an impact, but at the time I think this is an insight into you know, the real concept of the series and the imagination of the series that you've got this gleaming white control room and a large room impossibly inside the what for the time was the ordinary trappings of a London police box. It's so, so well done. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's uh, that's my third favourite. Yeah, it is, and it's and it's so easy to take for granted that uh, that they uh, that they did that, and we've seen it happen so many times since. But it's amazing how many of the things that they do first time that they get absolutely right first time. Again, it's almost as if it, it knows it's the benchmark for something that's going to endure. Which, of course, they didn't. I, you know, I've imposed that upon it afterwards, but thank god they did it how they did it because it means that watching that first episode feels so momentous even though at the time it wasn't remotely as momentous as it as it turns out to be you know they could have could have taken them a few weeks to well of course they had two goes at this but it could have taken them a while to get into the groove but they hit the ground running and uh as i say it's it's it well it's not diminished by the fact that we've seen similar things so many times since because they do it so well the first time round well done, them. My fourth one, right, this is just me. <laughs> it's the line, have you ever thought what it's like to be wanderers in the fourth dimension? Have you? To be exiles? And I like it because every time I hear it, I think, if you're asked the question, have you ever thought what it's like to be wanderers in the fourth dimension? Have you to be exiles? The obvious answer to that question should be, A, of course I haven't. Why would I? <laughs> Uh, every single time. It just makes me smile. It's just me. Uh, it's not just you, actually, Andrew, because uh, Beth and I, Beth Axford and I both chose that, although for different reasons. I mean, yes, if you scrutinise it, you go, yes, it's a ridiculous line because nobody has ever won. Nobody's ever... I mean, sometimes you wondered what it's like to win an Oscar or to be king or to uh, marry Jennifer Aniston or, you know, whatever, um, uh, or to, you know... Uh, turn base metal into gold or win the lottery or whatever. Nobody's ever thought of walking down the street. I wonder what it's like to be a wanderer in the fourth dimension. <laughs> but, like so much of Doctor Who, in its context and in its execution, it is more than the sum of its parts. It transcends the fact that it actually doesn't really make any sense because it's such a beautiful piece of writing. It's so beautifully delivered and it's so stylistically emblematic of the show and evocative that it's wonderful and it makes perfect sense even though it doesn't that's doctor who it makes perfect sense even when it doesn't and i almost feel bad sort of picking it apart but uh, you know andrew makes a very good point it 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 is it is not a line that really makes sense apart from the fact 
we need something that is clippable, that speaks to the majesty and mystery and strangeness and introduces us to Doctor Who. And it's that line, and it happens within the context of a of a sort of testy exchange uh, and, and sums up, you know, what the Doctor and, his, and, and Susan do and what they're about to get Ian and Barbara to do and indeed all of us with them. Wonder is in the fourth dimension of space and time. It's much better than travellers, isn't it? Wanderers. It suggests something sort of aimless yet questing. Again, a, a, a sort of almost a contradiction within itself that just works. And that's what people are, you know. We're all a mass of contradictions uh, and things that do work and things that don't work and good things and bad things. And, 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 you know, views that aren't necessarily compatible within, within ourselves. You know, we've all got a slightly, you know, hypocritical or, or contradictory nature and elements. And sometimes we, you know, do not treat others how we'd like to be treated ourselves. Or we have views that, that seemingly don't tie up because sometimes we might compromise our views because of self-interest or all of those things. And yet we can try for all our con contradictory natures and contrariness and uh, apparent conflictions and limitations to 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 somehow exceed all of those things and what we are so yeah hmm got probably got a little bit too highfalutin there but i i do like doctor who <laughs> um okay so that was number 4 number 5 uh i won't be the only one to pick this it's a closing shot the TARDIS uh, on this vast plane, its light flashing, no longer in the in the um, in the junkyard, and then of course we see the shadow of an approaching, watching figure coming at a shot. It's not yet clear that this is a caveman or even that it's human. It could be alien, and then boom, we're into the titles, and what a hook, what a cliffhanger! Absolutely fantastic, um, and so so well shot and realised um, and we're off the TARDIS has made its first journey anyway Toby those are my five favourite things I'm I'm sure others have chosen some of them um, thanks for asking for my contribution mate cheers bye ah oh, that's Andrew Smith who wrote Full Circle uh, and he chose uh, you're not you are you are the first to have chosen that final shot Andrew the only other person that chose that was me so I'm always I'm very pleased when uh, I get at least one of the same things as as the guests and I summed up why I thought that that final shot was so Doctor Whoey and I'm glad you chose it as well I, a lot of people when they sent to me said oh god this is going to be so repetitive everyone's going to choose the same things uh, I'm hoping you're enjoying this listeners because people don't seem to be choosing the same things which just goes to show what a wonderful multifaceted uh, experience Doctor Who is and, and how we all bring our different perspectives to it and it and it and it flicks different switches within us um so okay we've moved on to writers have we uh well how about um we speak to somebody who has written for Doctor Who media uh in various different forms notably on the page I, I think is one of the funniest people uh, uh, around the world of Doctor Who. I, I think his turn of phrase and his ability with language and just his impish sense of fun really floats my boat and tickles my sensibilities. And uh, so I wanted him to contribute. And he also has done a Happy Times and Places on a story that isn't quite so celebrated as this. So it was time to get him on board for this milestone um i've no idea if he introduces himself or not. every time i've gone and it's this person and they do this they've got because i haven't listened to these of course the first thing they do is go hello i'm this person i've done this and whereas if i go now i'm gonna get our next guest on and in open brackets they will presumably introduce themselves and so i don't need to say anything close brackets and they just go hello here are my favorite things so now i've not said this person's name they will remain a mystery for the next minute or so as they just go my favorite thing about an unearthly child is but let's see if if this time i've lucked out in the introductory stakes or if i'm always going to do the exact opposite of what is required but that's part of the fun isn't it is this fun i hope you're having fun 
Hi Toby, this is James Goss and I have five things for you about the very first episode of Doctor Who. First of all, let's talk about the interior TARDIS noise. When Ian and Barbara first go in, we never hear the TARDIS noise inside quite so loud again. Um, it's almost as though our ears have grown used to it. But in fact, you kind of think, oh, it's really interesting. They make a really big deal about how loud the inside of the TARDIS is. And then in future episodes, they just dial it down an awful lot. Um, as though as the viewer, we've gone from being very disconcerted by the TARDIS to used to it, just like Ian and Barbara. Ah, lovely James Goss, um, who needs no introduction, but and he gave you his name then, didn't he? But uh, uh, would likely play down his contributions to the show, which are Legion. He produced, uh, you know, that he's produced animations from Scream of the Shalker and Sharda to the to the to the first missing episode recreation, the Invasion one, which still, uh, you know, uh, st- stands up as as a as one of the strongest entries into uh, that particular. Uh, area of of Doctor Who resurrection. I uh, did the Infinite Quest as well, of course, and he's written uh, so many Doctor Who books as well and Torchwood stuff, uh, including Torchwood on the radio. So you know, James James is all over Doctor Who and always a producer of fine work. But mostly, he's I yeah, I just really enjoy listening to and reading James and I let's continue to do so uh see yes he's he's right about that I did I did I mean I did choose sound as as part of mine and and that is part of it is that it it is almost like we the program sort of says to us you know without saying you know it's always this loud but but you've heard that now and we don't need to do that for the for the rest of it we've established that so it's in the back of your head even if you haven't that's not the first episode of Doctor you've ever seen we've done the work it's now it's now a bit like Heathrow Airport. You just stop hearing the aeroplanes, but they're still there. Um, so the show in its first episode is going. Yeah, we'll 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 make you have to endure this racket, this noise. Though it's a very very good noise, and it's it's just a hum. But that's taken a you know a lot to produce to get the right pitch tone and everything else like that to say you know this is unearthly machinery working with inside this otherwise you know humble uh, carapace uh, metropolitan uh, uh, law enforcement. Uh, carapace um and yeah it's never that loud again and it never needs to be but we all know because it is in that first episode that it that it really is they're just saving us the viewer from having to to battle through that very good my second thing about an unearthly child is the tardis console specifically susan's line don't touch it it's live What's great about this is the idea that even from the start of Doctor Who, the TARDIS console is clearly stuck together with wishes and prayers. You know, it might technically be an advanced piece of science fiction technology that humanity is incapable of comprehending. But also, who builds something that has switches that go live? You know, what? This is insane there's there's an element that still hangs over an earthly child of it the tardis itself is a mad invention built by a madman oh i like that i've never considered that before because of course the doctor does flick a switch doesn't he because he knows ian's going to try and operate it and so it electrocutes him but we've never seen that since have we the uh the the panel of the tardis that electrocutes you if you try to use it so is that a deliberate defense mechanism uh, which that's what i've always read it as that the doctors flick to flick to switch to make anybody who tries to then do anything get electrocuted um I never think that sound effect's quite right. It, it sounds like a sort of more general sound effect than a flick, ah, electric, but that's a that's a tiny, tiny quibble. Um, and I never quite understood that the first time I watched it because she, she, she says the line very, very quickly. Um, uh, but um, I like the way Hartnell just very subtly goes up to the, to the console and flicks it there. Um, but I'm, I haven't read it in James's way of going, oh, it's because it's actually it's a bit rackety and there are, there are loose connections everywhere and it's and it's jerry built. But I very much prefer my TARDIS as a as a sort of jerry built piece of technology than something lofty that has been grown in a hive or, or, or whatever. You know, I'm not I'm not I, 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 I err less to the it's organic and vaguely sentient and more towards the I mean, I don't mind it being vaguely sentient. Actually, if that's part of its control mechanism or the operational um, makeup, I, th- I think that you can, if you delve beneath 
the bric-a-brac to get to that idea i think i think that's great but i think of that very much as being something sort of slightly ephemeral and unreachable this suggestion that oh is it is it sort of listening to us does it kind of know i now i, I kind of like that but but for its aspect and for its you know physical creation I, I like the idea that as time has gone by doctor who has had to fix it uh, and 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 does so with the technology at their disposal which is you know i like the sort of chess pieces i like the custard creams i like all of that stuff that that you know the the manual typewriter thing i i i like the idea that uh, yeah the do- the doctor sort of botching it together cuz be honest and and i think this will crop up a lot you know i'm i'm a botcher so i like i like the idea that the doctor is as c- crap in that regard as as i am because then it makes it charming rather than incompetent and i would rather be charming than incompetent even though i know the reality is sadly not the same as the fiction but i'd never i'd never read the live wire as that but uh i like that interpretation james my third thing about an unearthly child is um that our heroes, our viewpoint characters, are Ian and Barbara. Now, my comparison series here are The Avengers and Adam Adamant. Both of them feature two people roaring their way through uh, the swinging 60s uh, in a sea of champagne and glamour. Uh, the pilot of Adam Adaman shows Piccadilly Circus at its maddest uh, and Soho at its gloriously seediest. And obviously the Avengers from Honor Blackman through to Diana Rigg just is living the high life. It is living its best life in the 60s. Ian and Barbara, by contrast to the Avengers, well, it's, hard, it's, it's hardly glam. Those two are so ordinary. You can smell the sardines on toast that they go home to in their miserable little boarding lodges. You know, this is real London. Oh, I love that. I had never considered that. That is a great observation. Maybe that's why I warm to Doc Two more. I, I love uh, the Avengers and Adam Adamant as sort of, you know, kitsch, kitsch 60s. And, and, and you know, I really appreciate all the you know the beautiful uh, stylish costuming policies and the fact that they are design classics and the fact that you can get those brilliant you know iconic photographs and that they they you know they ooze 60s out of every every sort of black and white photo of uh, of, of those characters looking swish and stylish and you know the yeah the avengers they're, you know, they're popping champagne aren't they in the the opening titles i know that's the slightly later one um but they are swish they are they are A grade. They are aiming, and they are aiming to be. You know, this is fun and funky and pretty cool, and we're with it. And and Adam Adamant obviously is there to contrast with that. So his when his surroundings are when the sixties is upped, that uh, 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 exaggerates his fish out of water nature. But he is still, you know, a stylish swish, a high end person. You know, he's an aristocrat, isn't he? And and a swashbuckling adventurer type. But Ian and Barbara are. Picardigan middle class suburbia. Um, they're called Ian and Barbara, same name as my neighbours. Uh, they're they're teachers. They they don't have lofty ambitions. And this and I and you know what I and I like the, I, I and I do prefer that again because I'm it's what I'm used to in my image. I, I do prefer that than this idea that I only take the best people and God, you're extraordinary despite the fact you've done you know, that we have no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, you know, I I I actually prefer more the the sort of more understated, ordinary people capable of great things, in inverted commas, ordinary of course. But then we don't go, so aren't you special? Because I think the subtext is everybody has it within them to be brave to be amazing and then that when you're feeling alone lost sticking out like a sore thumb or being totally unnoticed not feeling special feeling worried about the future wondering if you'll ever amount to anything this program goes i bet you if aliens invaded you'd do something brave you'd do your best you'd You'd sacrifice your life. You'd you know get mortally wounded as everyone's escaping the spaceship. Say, stay, leave me. I shall, I shall crash it into the the, the houses of Parliament or whatever. Um, it it offers a it offers a hope of going. You don't 
actually, you don't have to be the enigmatic time child. You don't have to be this extraordinary, special person. I only take the best. Um, I can see why they do that because it's uh, you know it's it's I I and and I and I I'm not criticising that really because I lo- I you know I love New Who and I lo- I love all of those characters. Rose Tyler is one you know one of the greatest companions ever you know and key to the to the relaunch of of the show. But I like it when it's a bit you know like Donna the ordinary you know the ordinary temp. But again they they had they didn't they feed through the 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 because they threw forward to when she became the extraordinary character. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm, I am I'm much more, oh yeah, it's, it, it, we're, we're, everyone, if put to the test, is capable of growth. That's what Doctor Who says, isn't it? And it says ordinary things and ordinary situations can become amazing, strange, frightening, weird. The everyday can become fascinating if you allow it to. It's about sort of living life to its extremes. Now, with that comes extreme danger. But with the extreme danger becomes the adrenaline of everything else. And with the extreme danger becomes the character tests that make you braver than you thought you were, funnier than you thought you were in the face of danger. You know, digging deep. It's about, It's all about digging deep. And actually, it's more remarkable if somebody very, very ordinary and every day digs deep than if the special chosen one does. Uh, but I'd never thought of it in in those ways, and that and that 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 Ian and Barbara absolutely encompass that. I also love the fact that they're sort of you know almost middle aged as well. I mean, although terrifyingly for me, younger, I still think of them as older than me, even though I'm actually older now than they are in that. But they're still older than me, um, and I think that I love those two actors. Um, but the fact that Ian and Barbara are so sixties ordinary, of course, is again part of its genius. All the pieces matter. All the pieces matter. My fourth thing about an unearthly child, and it's connected to the third, is that a whole era of English history is evoked in an unearthly child. I've talked about how Ian and Barbara live clearly mundane lives. But if you look at an unearthly child, an entire era. More than that, a piece of television that defines us all is created by three and a half sets. That's the most incredible achievement. Um, Just the idea that you've got like the TARDIS, you've got a junkyard, and you've got a little bit of school and half a car. And somehow they create this nightmare haunting story that goes on and becomes something that just unpacks and unpacks and unpacks. Um, you know, we know how ordinary Susan's life is. We know how ordinary Ian and Barbara are. This life is what Susan yearns for. She yearns for the smog and the grunginess and the unexcitingness. That's what she wants. And you sort of start to realise why. Ah, well, I mean, that ended on a on a slightly different note from the one it started on, but... Um... You know, it it does indeed. You know, it it sets something in motion that is so vast, and yet, I mean, there's only there's only that one pre-film shot, isn't there? Uh, well, I suppose there's the photograph of the receding, uh, but 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 actually, in terms of you know, footage of actors doing things, there's not a shot of Susan walking the London streets. There is that external, that ex- external. Uh, junkyard moment but she's that's in the studio that's part of the main set and there's a brilliant Clayton Hickman has uh has has um you know restored those photos and 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 created a brilliant junk you know external of the junkyard vista which you don't quite see in all its glory in in the episode and and I mean Brahatsky's work is is amazing in in this but that's not really what James was talking about he was actually talking about the sort of the the, the the small space that launched a thousand spaces, a thousand time and spaces, and it, it does seem extraordinary because it's yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a school, bit of a junkyard, bit of a car, and then this amazing spaceship. <laughs> but then at the end, we're suddenly on that first film shot, and uh, and the uh, and the shadow falls. How amazing! Now, my final thing about. An Unearthly Child episode one is 
And it's a thing that I only spotted thinking about this for you. Uh, but everyone celebrates Edge of Destruction or the Mind Robber as being stories that only feature the regulars in speaking roles. And you go, oh, that's so brave. That's so format shaking. Isn't that exciting? Wow. An unearthly child only has the four regulars having speaking roles. It's incredible. And we never actually talk about that. We talk about every other aspect of world building. We don't talk about the fact that the world is built with only four speaking characters. Because that's all the story needs and that's all we need to know. Thank you. Thank you, James. And do avail yourself of James's work if you can, if you haven't already. But I'm sure you have because he's prolific and admired. And rightly so. He's also a very lovely guy. Um... And uh, yeah, I could I could read what he writes forever because I think he's very funny. Um, uh, he's more than funny. I don't I don't mean to you know it's it's funny, isn't it? When you say oh somebody's funny, it's almost like you're you're damning them with fake praise. But, but being funny is actually not that easy. Uh, but he's but it's like yes, but he can also be serious as well. Um, we have to we have to say because it's not enough to be funny. It's not enough to entertain people and make them laugh. You know you have to you know you know you have to you have to be sad sometimes too. J- James is is all all things, but he's very funny. Um, and that's very true, isn't it? Uh, I hadn't really thought about that because yes, it's true. We 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 think of all the the episodes that uh, that only have you know that the regulars credited, um, uh, or or that are you know told with you know the the bare bones of the cast as it were but that's what there's, there's yeah there's no actor that has to come back and 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 do their part again their guest part uh you, you know and 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 you know that would have been a claim to fame for somebody wouldn't it i was i was one of the guest cast of the very first episode of doctor Who. nobody was leslie bates is the closest shadow of cal but nobody interviewed him and he goes on to be an extra in 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 loads oh i suppose there's red cranfield the policeman yeah but nobody ever interviewed him you know we've never spoken to those guys uh but in terms of speaking actual credited hired actors to rehearse with the cast and play a part there's nobody it's the four the four of them carved that show into shape together with that very cleverly wrought dynamic that that brilliant economic writing and 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 through the characters who were all shaped to be to fill a particular hole to fill a particular need to 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 slot perfectly into it each part of the sort of four-sided puzzle that is the that is the dynamic required to then take us into the adventures that we're going to have everybody needs to cover a certain a certain base in order to be able to tell the stories we're going to encounter the most effectively and those characters have to be established in this episode and yet it doesn't ever seem like they're going and this is where we get to know what these people are like one of them is a mystery two of us are following that mystery to try and solve it and they find another mystery uh, and then they don't get many answers apart from one that sounds crazy that they're travelers in space and time and then we're off and then we travel in space and time for ages and forever and we almost don't look back you know they occasionally go oh we want to go home and they do eventually go home but actually it's about that we we don't look back to that episode particularly for for for, for ages in a sense that it's you know yeah we're trying to get back home we're trying to get Ian and Barbara back home but but actually the the storytelling though those are just sort of beats in the story the the, the storytelling is we're and but we're having these adventures right now uh and how extraordinary that is and that that's all told in this first episode with with four characters yeah good observation thank you james uh now let's have a writer who's never written for doctor who has written some prolifically uh, lots of television. Now I've just opened his folder, and it just says "Unearthly One," "Unearthly Two," "Unearthly Three," "Unearthly Four," "Unearthly Five. So maybe he hasn't done uh, an introduction. He has actually been in Doctor Who because he's a writer and an actor, and he's in a an important first episode. He is in Deep Breath, Peter Capaldi's first episode, 
it's a sort of only a cameo, nothing only about being a cameo, but he's he's the waiter who says, you know, spleen and all of that. Um, it's it's a cameo from a from an actor who's, uh, you know, played played big parts in things. He's uh, a, lo- a lot of comedy stuff as well. But he's also a Death Eater in uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, for goodness sake. He was in uh, Dr. Terrible's House of Horrible and Ideal. He, he was in loads of episodes of, of Ideal, uh, the Johnny Vegas comedy that featured all the comedians in Manchester, apart from me. Um, but uh, Graham, our guest, Graham Duff, also wrote Ideal. Uh, he wrote uh, the sitcom Hedem, Heben with Jason Cook. I was in an episode of that. Uh, he wrote Dr. Terrible's House of Horrible with uh, with with Steve, you know, that was Steve Coogan show. Uh, he's done all sorts of stuff. He's a producer as well. So he's a producer, he's an actor, he's a writer. He's a lovely chap. He's also a huge Doctor Who fan who's also cameoed in Doctor Who. And he's also on the commentary for episode three of The Time Monster before he'd been in Doctor Who. So I like to say, I like to feel I was getting him on that uh, in anticipation, a bit like the decimal system. I was anticipating that he would then cameo in a Peter Capaldi episode of Doctor Who. That was entirely in my mind when I asked him to do that uh, fan slash writer commentary for episode three of the the Time Monster that also has uh, Joe Lidster and uh, Phil Ford and 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 people who who written for, for for the Doctor Who universe, which Graham hasn't, but uh, because he'd written for other television, I thought he would be an interesting contributor. And I knew he'd be game. And it was, we were all doing it for free. So <laughs> I needed that. So uh, it's Graham Duff. And he's going to give us his five favourite things about an unearthly child, beginning with his file, which is called Unearthly One. My name is Graham Duff. I'm a writer, producer, actor and Veneer, and the first thing I love about this opening episode is, of course, uh, Delia Darbish's arrangement of Ron Grainer's theme tune. And, uh, of course, we know what it means now. It means adventures in space and time. It means the Doctor. But, of course, back then, it didn't have any of those connotations. So I think it must have sounded so strange and so bizarre and certainly unlike anything that would normally be heard on television at the time. And I think in combination with the image of uh, the policeman and the torch moving through the fog, I think it suggests that some dreadful uh, morbid crime has, uh, has taken place. And uh, I like how long it goes on. Uh, I like the fact that you don't see anybody's hand pushing open the door to the uh, to the yard, so maybe that's a supernatural occurrence. And I like how when the music finally fades, uh, it's replaced by another electronic noise, the sound of the TARDIS. I think it's a really powerful opening, this. It's interesting. I thought he was just choosing the music there, which, again, I mean, I could talk about the music forever. It is a brilliant theme, and Delia Darbyshire's arrangement is extraordinary. And it is made by no sounds that we can understand and yet it we we can uh, uh, you know we can assimilate it into our into our uh brains and so it, it it's you know it's not it's not just a mess um but he's he's gone on to expand there uh, you know as as i did and uh, uh as as others have you know to fixate on that that opening uh which is never done again uh, and would we be choosing it if it had been done again? If if the music had away, you know gone on that long, and had a magic door, and and only be cut off by you know by another sound, you know that is that is unique. It's the way that the show starts, but doesn't start again, and uh, and and it and it probably wouldn't be quite so special if if it played with doing that, um, and then and then just sort of gradually stopped over time. It's the beginning of the first episode. And, and it's special, uh, just by accident. Beautiful. Graham, uh, oh, and he did introduce himself. See, I see, he did introduce himself. I'm going to get this wrong more likely than anything else. <laughs> right, something to look out for, innit? Uh, so, Graham's second thing. My second favourite thing about this episode is the piece of music that Susan's listening to on her radio. It's called Three Guitars Mood 2, and it's by the Art They Nelson Group. Uh, it came out as a single two years earlier, and uh, this track is actually the B-side. Uh, the A-side was called Three Guitar Moods 1. And um, this was, in fact, the, the, the second time that this piece of music had been used on a uh, debut episode of a series because it had been used a year earlier on the opening episode of the BBC crime series Z Cars. 
And I think there's an irony here in that Susan's um, Susan's dance moves suggest she's sort of tuning in to some alien or futuristic element in the music. But uh, the reality is in, in November 1963, this kind of twangy, shadows-esque surf music uh, was uh, in the process of being superseded uh, during the first wave of Beatlemania. And so this music was about to sound old-fashioned, whilst the Beatles' music sounded futuristic. Ah, that's very good. Now, um, Graham clearly knows his, his music. That's very, well, it's a bit wreathy in that, wasn't it? We had a bit of uh, in, information, uh, entertainment and education all rolled into one uh, entry. Uh, I've got a nagging feeling now, because I mentioned that it appears in the first episode of Zed Cars. I'm now worried that I went later, because, of course, I didn't see the first episode of Zed Cars until many years after I'd seen all episodes of Doctor Who. Um, uh, uh, and of course, but, of course, Zed Cars preceded Doctor Who, but uh, it's later for me, uh, and so that's going to nag me, and I'd love to go back and edit it out if I have made that mistake, because uh, I don't like to be seen to be wrong. Uh, uh, but um, I'm not going to, so I'll just say now, I know Zed Cars was before Doctor Who, and if I, I don't even know if I said later, and I certainly can't be bothered to listen back to f- trawl through my own voice. It's the same as I've got an, the nagging thing. Did I think I've got a feeling I said Susan in the pilot said she's from the 52nd segment century and she's from the 49th century. 52nd is, of course, the 52nd segment of time, uh, which is uh, featured in the arc. Um, I know that. You know that I know that. But the fact that I think I might have got that wrong uh, when... Uh, trying to articulate and entertain at the same time will will is will nag at me as I'm editing this together and putting it out. So don't say anything. Just, yeah, I, you know I know you know I know. Um, but nonetheless, I, I've I've ever since uh, about a couple of minutes after I'd said that, I've gone. Did I say fifty? Se- I might have said fifty second. And uh, and ever since it's been at the back of my head, gnawing away at me. Uh, so hopefully better out than in. <laughs> God, I'm I'm a mass of uh, um, a, a jumpy paranoia. It's pathetic. It's terrible. This is why I have to hide in a in a television program, and 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 I'm happiest when I'm shutting up and just enjoying it. So why am I doing this? Because I want to share the love, and because I've got all these brilliant people who are you know embodiments of why doctor who is such a wonderful show and i think it's great to hear their different uh, their different takes on it and their different inspiration and I, I, isn't that lovely that both andrew and graham in, interestingly have chosen that piece of music i don't think i've ever heard three guitars mood one maybe that's uh, something i need to do between now and christmas why not little task to set myself uh, but I, I, lo- I love the fact that graham was compelled to tell us a few facts about it um as i say i researched it for the too much information podcast and there's, there's, as i say there's some details about it and about the people that made it but it's funny now with stuff that i research and put down i i, I kind of don't remember it i i know i know it because i put it out there and i've got it written down but i don't retain information in the same way that i used to is that because i'm getting old or is that because i know well i don't need to keep it in my head because i can just go back and look it up wherever i i wrote it down or put it out there whereas in the old days you know if i was scamming a cast list in a library that was in a radio times that was sequestered in birmingham library uh, you know i could either take photocopies or i could remember the you know who the, the cast lists so um uh, you know, you you had so much more that you committed to memory. Just, just not. I mean, not. You know, I didn't. I wasn't sort of actively staring at it until it went into my mind. But I, you know, one's brain was equipped or trained or expected to to hold this stuff because uh, you never knew when you'd pick up that document again. Whereas now, you know, you can pretty much get anything anywhere. So you know, the stuff I've looked up on Wikipedia, not about Doctor Who, but about, about other stuff you know, capitals or, or, or historical facts or whatever that I've gone back to three or four times because I've I've remembered I kind of know a thing, but I don't know exactly because I haven't remembered it exactly. Uh, and that's a, that's a strange thing about memory. I hope it's just that all our memories are like that now, even the young people's, and that it's not a sign of my brain atrophying because it's actually the only thing I've ever been able to do that um, I've, I've been able to do that... that, that uh, you know, to, to any degree of satisfaction for me uh, uh, in terms of my output as a human being is that I've been able to remember f- things about Doctor Who. So if, I, if I'm if I suddenly can't do that, I'm in real trouble. Uh, thing three. 
The next thing I really like here is how they discuss the identity of the band, uh, John Smith and the Common Men. And of course, Ian has this additional information that John Smith started out as the Honourable Aubrey Waits and then became Chris Waits of Chris Waits and the Carolers. And it's a little throwaway thing in the script. It's sort of played for humour, really. But what I particularly like about it is it serves as a, as a pre-echo of this notion that people might not be what they seem, that somebody could have more than one identity or somebody could evolve through a series of identities and of course that's one of the concepts at the very heart of Doctor Who and uh, coincidentally the Doctor himself would later assume the name of John Smith Oh Graham I had never thought of that That I I love that bit and I I did try and talk about there's so much going on in that scene I do I love Ian's you know yeah the right honourable Aubrey Waits Chris Waits and the Carolers because it seems real uh, and it's very sort of 16, you know, and that a teacher might know. about, And it's, it's a lovely teacher-pupil thing as well, of course, is that, oh, the teacher's not such a square after all. He knows about his pop. Um, but the fact that it sounds entirely plausible that there would be this, uh, the Honourable Aubrey Waits, who would then have a, a band that are called the Common Men, which, that we, I mean, that works as well, as well as the fact that John Smith and the Common Men is a, is a really good name for a band. It's a really great sort of punning name for a band as well. Um, but the fact that an aristocrat is the person behind that band, that is very, very interesting. Um, but then again, then they get that other level of go and Chris Waits and the Carolers, which sounds perfectly plausible and like a thing. And it's, it's, I think it's beautifully rendered backstory that means nothing. That is just colour that just, as I say, you know, plays, plays that joke of the teacher not being so square. But it's so, I so totally believe it. Um, I, you know, I would defy a, a, a modern viewer not to watch it and go, oh, they're probably just talking about a real band, you know. Um, but I'd never thought, oh, it's a forward echo to the fact that we have this. Well, we don't know he's a lord, do we? Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, the Honourable Aubrey Waits, the, 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 time, the Time Lord. We don't know he's a Time Lord. We don't know he's going to assume the moniker John Smith. It's just a happy accident that he does both of those things. But even without those, yeah, it is about somebody who is not all he seems, who has a secret, who has a nom de plume. Um, that's enough. I, but I hadn't considered even that. But the fact that, that time then means that that takes on even more resonance and relevance. That's a brilliant observation. I love that, Graham. Uh, and again, you know, that's, you can see something new in something that is so familiar just because somebody gives you a different perspective. I love that observation. And it means that that bit I love for, for reasons I can't quite discern, apart from just the fact that I like the way it's written and the way that William Russell does it, now has extra resonance and import. And I love that. The next thing I really like is William Hartnell and his performance. I think it's so good, so well judged. And it's often said about this episode that it's one of the few episodes of Doctor Who that lack an adversary or uh, a monster or an alien threat. But of course, in this narrative, uh, it's the Doctor himself who is the alien threat because uh, Barbara and Ian just can't trust him and he seems uh, abrasive and evasive and somewhat aggressive. And so they cannot trust him and nor can the audience. And it's worth bearing in mind that uh, at this point in his career, William Hartnell was best known for playing uh, mean-spirited, and aggressive characters, uh, gangsters and uh, sergeants and so on. Uh, so that's what they would have been expecting. They wouldn't have expected him to be a hero. So I think it's a really nice choice and beautifully delivered by Hartnell. Yay, I'm so pleased. I mean, again, one of the reasons I didn't choose Hartnell because I was I assumed everybody else would. Um, but that's great from Graham putting it in the context of, you know, how, how well-known Hartnell was when he was. Uh, and what he was well known for, you know, those, yeah, those sergeant figures. Um, and the fact that he's there playing this wizard who, you know, is big and smiley and strange and eccentric, but is also dangerous and is also scary. And that, that will have been heightened by, by Hartnell's image. Although, again, he's, it's, a, it's a kind of dissonant, uh, fractured version of the image they have of him because he's got the wig and the hat and, and seems all sort of space wizardy. Uh, so it's, again, Doctor Who taking something familiar, but in, in this on this occasion an actor um and and you know give, giving a slightly weird reflection of 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 the image that the viewers at the time would have of that actor uh and and of course you know that the, the show would not sustain having a character who was 
so dangerous and unpredictable and unpleasant and and it's quite right that Hartnell metamorphoses fairly quickly into you know the the hooting uh you know joy, joyful eccentric traveler and and that and the dynamic between that quartet becomes far less frosty although he does sort of lose his temper but it's more as a you know as a as a grumpy old man than a dangerous space wizard um and of course they've tried to make the doctor alien and unlikable since and it's never quite worked and they quite rightly say oh but you know Hartnell was that that's what the doctor originally was but it's almost like yeah you can start the show like that but it's it's sort of unsustainable thereafter uh and and he and 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 it, it has that the doctor has to become a character that we know and love and want to be with even though you can have within that darkness and unpredictability but it the doctor will never quite be able to be what the doctor is in that first episode ever again out of necessity for the show and the viewership but it's beautiful that he is that in this episode and hartnell is pitch perfect he is pitch perfect and the final thing i love about this episode is the toll that time travel seems to take on the time travellers. It's not just flicking a switch and then you dematerialise somewhere and then materialise somewhere else. It clearly takes a toll. It can knock you out. It makes you tense. It makes you stare into this swirling void. And I think that's a really exciting thing for the first episode. This isn't some easy form of transport. This is a big deal. And then when we finally see um, the TARDIS in that alien landscape, uh, again, something we take for granted now, there, there's the TARDIS in an alien landscape. But at the time, that very familiar image of the police box in some sort of blasted landscape, I think would have seemed far more uh, surreal a juxtaposition than it does now. I just think this is a great episode. Ah, oh, thanks, Graham. It is a great episode. And uh, thank you for helping I hope make this episode of Happy Times and Places to be a great one. Yeah, I, I talked about the the you know the sheer pain and discomfort of that first journey through time and space. That of course it would have been quite tedious if the show had done that every week. That everybody had to recover from uh, from a difficult journey. Um, uh, and and that image, which you know, I I let's not have me talking about it forever. Uh, I, I think I already have at length. But um, yes, two good choices. Uh, well, five five good choices in all. Thanks to Graham Duff. Do avail yourself of uh, of his work, and uh, I, I hope to get him on the the podcast proper. Um, because uh, yeah, this is what's quite fun about this is, is some of these guests have not been on Happy Times and Places before. Not necessarily because they haven't been asked, but they were able to do it this time, where where they might have um, you know life got in the way. Uh, when they've been asked previously people have people have pulled out all the stops which is why this is going on forever uh and if i was to be doing something forever i would like it to be in the company of some you know smart hoovers and shakers and there's no more of a of a hoover there's no bigger a hoover there's there's no the, the dice this is the dyson of uh, uh although uh, Let's not get into that. Um, I, actually, Dyson's. I, I've got all sorts of issues with Dyson's, um, but both op operationally and in terms of personnel. But I, I just thought, I just thought it, I, the only other Hoover I thought of was Henry, and um, I don't know if Henry the Hoover, you know, suggests illustriousness. He is very charming though, and he's got a face I like a Hoover with a face. If I'm to have a Hoover, I'd rather have one with a face than with all that see-through gubbins that make you go, look at me. I'm a spaceship. You're just a Hoover. Dyson you're just a hoover I don't care that you look like a spaceship um I want I want one that looks like th Thomas the tank engine were here vacuum uh, but anyway let's let's get let's not this is already long enough without needing tortuous ill-prepared not remotely prepared um vacuum cleaner metaphors to describe a, a Doctor Who fan but who is a professional a professional it has been a professional actor has written has script edited Doctor Who, has played an important role in Big Finish, was also, when I was younger, the star writer and uh, later editor of Doctor Who magazine, um, who I met at a Doctor Who convention and found to be a thoroughly nice chap and has been 
and, and I've had, had the pleasure of working with only slightly peripherally. Uh, he's done important work on the on the DVD animations, and I've I've kind of tagged along for the ride, and occasionally interviewed him. But he's a he's a great commentator on Doctor Who. He's a great contributor to Doctor Who. He's contributed in perhaps to Doctor Who in perhaps more areas than anybody else. Uh, and uh, you know he he does us a great honour by being on this podcast. I'm not going to say his name, uh, which means that he probably won't say his name either. But let's give it a go. Good morning, Toby. This is Gary Russell, and I'm going to be reading you my five things I like about Doctor Who in an exciting adventure with an unearthly child. Um, oh wait, it's an unearthly child, it's not that exciting, is it? Anyway, here we go. Susan Foreman, what an intriguing character she is. Are we supposed to like her, mistrust her, or be scared of her? Carol Ann Ford's performance is pitch perfect at creating mystery. The only disappointment here, for anyone who's seen the original pilot recording, is the raw sash ink blot sequence where Susan accidentally draws the TARDIS ceiling light, being dropped in favour of that very unconvincing French Revolution book prop. That would have added a, a far better sense, I think, of alienation than her just moaning about a history book that's wrong, which has been a sort of staple joke of time travel stories since the eras of Vernon Wells. Ah, interesting. I mean, I I love the raw shark, um, but I don't think it's clear, you know. And and I think is isn't that what Sidney Newman writes in his notes? What's she doing? Um, and it's funny. I thought it was the console, not the line. Anyway, um, it's it's I, I I love it, and I talk I've talked about the ink blot, and again, so, you know, something so simple um, being so strange. And I, I love the economy of the French Re- Re- Revolution. But anyway, that's not really what Gary was concentrating on. He was concentrating on the title character performance. Carol Ann Ford is Susan Foreman. And, she, you know, she, she gets a chance in stories like The Sense Rights to be, to be weird again. But she's never quite as strange and unearthly as she is in this first episode. And I think that's a shame. The show is often hidebound by format. And I think I think Susan is is a character that, you know, is the first victim of, of that, of, of having to, you know, fulfil a particular role, which is at odds with the role that she plays in this first episode. And I think, you know, she would have been happier and, the you know, the, the character would be better in in the show if they'd been bold enough to be able to make her you know quite as strange as she is in that first episode but but she can't be she is as you know Sidney Newman's edict was that we need a kid to get into trouble which is much more simplistic um and it's almost like oh she's only unearthly in the first episode because that's what we've decided this first episode is going to be to get the the heroes in and it's like she she wasn't conceived as that she was conceived as the kid to get into trouble it's only when you know putting the episode together that Anthony Coburn and David Whittaker and C Weber whoever you know whoever uh, drove this particular um the dynamic of this particular episode went oh well why don't we make the kid who's going to be the one that gets into trouble the center of the mystery that leads us to the doctor so we have one mystery and then another mystery and it turns out that the the unearthly child is actually the secondary mystery because the show is called doctor who and that's the that's the first mystery and and one leads us to the other you know one is the gateway drug to the other the unearthly child is uh, uh you know we we smoke a bit of unearthly child and uh, and before long we're in, injecting doctor who into our veins um so so actually you know she it's not that she started off as weird and strange and ended up being the screaming girl she was conceived as the screaming girl and 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 this and her alien weirdness was imposed upon her for the story purposes of this opening installment um now it doesn't play out that way because we see this opening installment first so it seems like you know she that the, the character um diminishes as she she goes on but actually what it means is that they they gave her a heck of a start uh, before she settled into being what she should have been all of the time, that I mean, that doesn't really mean it mean anything apart from the fact that it, it's I'm enunciating a perspective on it that I've I've just noticed, um, but and, and, and which is you know a long way round to say that she's really good in it, um, and and probably never better than she is in this first episode, um, 
and it just just goes to show how much potential a lot of people in Doctor Who have that isn't always that isn't always they don't always have the the opportunity to show but when they do get to show it that is a good thing because we're concentrating on the positive and the positive is there's a brilliant performance from Caroline Ford in this episode as a really interesting beguiling character I like the fact that Ian and Barbara are school teachers and nice ones as the 60s was already starting to take an anti-authoritarian worldview as the wartime kids were growing up, it was nice to see something where teachers weren't seen to be unworthy of their trust. And whilst for a lot of kids in secondary modern state schools that might have felt old-fashioned, it was Ian and Barbara's charm and wit which makes them feel more like friends to Susan than a threat. Ah, well, there we go. We have uh, the, uh, another vote for the school teachers. And um, but but the fact that they're nice school teachers uh, is a is an interesting adjunct to that observation and that choice uh, and a good one. Thank you, Gary. Number three. The doctor's explanation about the size of the TARDIS control room using buildings seen on a television set as an example must have resonated so much with kids watching because for the majority of them, a television set was still a new sort of magical picture box that no one quite understood how it worked. So the doctor talking about magic and how it works using that is a really clever bit of writing. Yeah, it is. Uh, And of course, yes, television was pretty new and funky then. Uh, And uh, but I, I also love the fact that he then talks about, I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's he does it in a very dated way because of of the way he talks about Native Americans, but 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 the uh, the intent behind it is to say you with your modern fancy television and you people in the sixties, which is you know thinking of itself as being this you know amazing brand new bright thing of new technology and new freedoms and oh isn't this amazing aren't we great there's this guy landed going no everything you do is really old-fashioned and you don't understand the actual cool futuristic stuff because that's the stuff that i've got and i always love it when doctor who says to the modern day you think you're all that actually you're not all that and that's a lesson we always need to learn uh and i think particularly uh currently you know a lot of social commentators need to learn that uh that that the enlightenment that we have may may not seem quite so smart in 20 years time when we have become more enlightened about other things so i always think you shouldn't be too cocky about the technology and the attitudes that are at your disposal because they've been reached over a long period of time and you are you know standing on foundations built by others and you know they will be superseded and you will look pretty daft if you think you're the bee's knees because of the accident of time that has that has brought you to a situation where the the things that are technological to you seem like the most amazing things ever and the attitudes you have seem to me the most enlightened attitude attitudes ever because in 20 30 years time they will seem as quaint and dated as you know the the attitudes and technology of 20 30 years ago seem to us and the atti- you know and the attitudes and technology of the 1960s seem to the futuristic time traveller Doctor Who. So never be too complacent ab- about the times you live in because, t- t- you know, the passage of time makes fools of us all. I love the way the title sequence is used as the TARDIS dematerializes, implying that every week going forward, what we're actually seeing for the first I don't know, 23 seconds, roughly, of each episode is the TARDIS taking off and going through the space-time vortex. It's lovely imaginative stuff using visual effects of a type probably unseen before on telly at that period. I'm going to do that whole section again. I love the way the title sequence is used as the TARDIS dematerialises, implying that each and every week, what we're actually seeing for those first 23-odd seconds of every episode is the TARDIS actually taking off and going through the space-time vortex. It's lovely, imaginative stuff, using visual effects of a type probably unseen before on telly at that point. Yeah, I mean, I've I've talked about uh, this and... I mean, but I remember when I first saw it, when it was, you know, 18 years old, and it still seems sort of magical to me. 
an old fashioned, but not in a clunky way, old fashioned in a, oh, they used to do stuff in this way and, uh, 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 and, and yet it still totally works, although it's still, it, it did seem of, of its time rather than of the 80s, but that's because, you know, they're making it for black and white as opposed to the fact that, it, you know, that it didn't look real to me because it did look real, but it looked abstract and because they had to do things in an abstract way and, and Doctor Who being abstract always works for me. Um, I, I, and yeah, that I always get the implication that the, that the title sequence is 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 saying you're traveling through time right now, uh, and uh, but but and but also that that curious thing of you know we I so associated Doctor Who with having the Doctor's face in the titles, and of course Hartnell's face is not in the titles, um, even though they did experiment, didn't they? Uh, with having a face so even then they were thinking of it but they they couldn't do it um so much so that in the radio times 25th anniversary 20th anniversary special they had stills from each title sequence and where you know the the, the parallel one of hartnell where the uh where the other doctor's faces were in the titles they have a they have a you know a still of hartnell uh, because they still thought well even though there's not a tit- there's not a face in that title sequence, we have to put Hartnell where the face should be. You know, the subtext being from us looking back, you know, they sh- they should have had a face in the title. But I actually don't mind that they don't. I don't. I I, I quite like the fact that, uh, you know, the the titles all have a uniformity to them. It's a it's a travelling through space and time, and the Doctor's face appears at one point, except for that first one where it doesn't. Um, I you know because otherwise it would seem too neat, too planned, and Doctor Who is not neat and planned and 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 then the doctor themselves is 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 not neat and planned that final shot is amazing and offers up so much promise not just for what the next episode would bring but it's really a signpost for what the whole series would be about taking that one step each week into the unknown and leaving you desperate to see if you could work out what was happening before the tardis team did There you go, Toby. Hope that's useful. Oh, more than useful. And I'm very, very grateful. Uh, aren't people nice? You know, I, I came into the world of Doctor Who as a comedian doing a one-man show. I only had a couple of friends, really, that were Doctor Who fans. Uh, and, and, and But but none, really, that were, you know, quite as steeped in it as, as I was. I mean, friends who had the videos and knew the stuff. But, you know, nobody who I could talk to about the difference between... George Spenton Foster and Douglas Camfield or whatever. Um, and I didn't even want to be part of the world of Doctor Who fandom. I, you know, I didn't, the doctor, being a Doctor Who fan was a, a prominent in inverted commas. Doctor Who fan was not something I uh, aspired to be because, uh, you know, it's just being a fan, isn't it? You can be a fan in your, in your bedroom. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if anybody knows who your name is as a fan because you're still just a fan. Um, uh, and and so I, I I you know I I wasn't really certain about that that world and I I sort of slightly mistrusted it because I thought oh it's probably full of people that think they're it and actually and I and I know it can seem like that from afar and then you get into the world of it and and of course there are internecine squabbles everywhere staff rooms workplaces and of course within Doctor Who fandom but you just have to sort of blot those things out as you do in in other you know other parts of your life. And I have met some really, really nice people, really interesting and intelligent people who've sort of welcomed me and been very kind to me. And it's, you know, it's testament to that, that, that the, the amount of people that I've, I've got on this podcast who are people that have no reason to, uh, to be bestowing their time and energy and creativity onto, onto me. As I say, I'm just a lovey with an iPhone who's got a good memory for cast lists. But it enables me to make a better show that I have the input of these people whose names... And voices will all resonate with you, some more than others, depending on who you are. But they've all got very interesting perspectives and they all show what fascinating, interesting, kindly people um, are brought into the Doctor Who universe. And they've been very kindly to me, kind enough to reply to my emails and, and do this. There are still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven guests on this unearthly child extravaganza but for now i'm going to have a break i'm recording this now on the 23rd of november this is the day i'm in a race against time in order to get this podcast i still don't know if it's going to be a series of episodes i think it's going to have to be uh out in time to be released in time 
for the exact 60th anniversary of An Unearthly Child, which is today. I've still got a few hours to play with, but I've got other things I have to do as well. Uh, and I've got to edit these. Uh, so I'm, I'm right now I'm thinking this is going to be several episodes. Am I going to release them all on the same day, though? Am I going to release them over the next few days? Certainly I have to start on the 23rd, and I'm certainly recording on the 23rd. So it's kind of... Yeah, it's kind of all there and appropriate. But I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if it's going to be ready on time. And if it is ready on time, is it going to be any good? Or am I going to have to scrap it all and remount it and make it slightly more streamlined? Because that's happened before. Well, thank you very much indeed for listening to Happy Times and Places, which is presented by me, Toby Haydock. I'm very grateful to Matthew Waterhouse and Nicola Bryant for their birthday greetings, and thanks to my guests for giving me their five favourite things. They were Ben Cook, Andrew Smith, James Goss, Graham Duff and Gary Russell. I'm also indebted to the patrons who support these podcasts, and they include Ruben Herfindahl, Stephen Moffat, not that one, Peter Burns, James Curley smith Peter Harness, yes, that one, Ronald Hayden, Rob Leonard, Christopher Meredith, Gavin McLean, Richard Straw, Neil Tate, Nick Tedston, Tim Arding, Nigel Bromley, Paul Cook, Richard Chalk, Grant Davidson, John Deere, Chris Dunford Kelk, Paul Dunn, Jason Gorman, Siobhan Galichon, Chris Hyam, Ian Key, Joe Llewellyn, Philip Marsh, and Nathan Martin. The music is by Dave Gates, the artwork by Dylan Patterson. If you too would like to become a patron and get bonus and early content, go to patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock. Tiers start from £3 per month, and that's where you get all of the content. But uh, higher tiers get you mother little lures and things. But uh, it's all it's all free at the lowest tier, £3 per month, and 10% off any tier if you sign up for a year in advance. If you don't want the monthly commitment, you can do a one-off donation anytime at ko-fi.com forward slash Toby Haydock. Uh, but what costs you nothing, I know times are tough and I'm just grateful to you for listening. But if you could spend just a little bit of your time liking, subscribing, giving these five stars in any outlet you can and perhaps a couple of lines of review to lure the odd passing punter, that would be really, really helpful. There's Patreon, there's Kofi, there's Spotify, there's iTunes, there's Podbean, all those places to visit if you like this stuff. And as for the social media places, I'm on Twitter. I'm not calling it X. I mean, I don't call An Unearthly Child 100,000 BC. And that's been called 100,000 BC in, you know, by certain people in certain quarters a lot longer than Twitter's been called X. So you know where I'm coming from, he said, as he munched on an opal fruit. So uh, I'm there, Twitter, at Toby Haydock. These podcasts have their own feed, at Haydock Podcasts. I'm on Instagram at Toby.Haydock. I have a Facebook page as well, but go to the one that's for me as a comedian rather than my personal one because I'm trying to uh, delineate between my personal life and uh, the work that I do. And also you can follow my comedy club, Excess Malarkey, uh, on Twitter and Facebook as well. Thanks for doing so. have to say the reason that these podcasts have been so close to the wire and in fact past the wire i've been garroted by the wire is partially because of that message that you heard at the top from nicola bryant uh, uh perry which she recorded in my house because she was coming to do bbc breakfast uh which she did on the morning of the 23rd this morning as i record this it's still the 23rd i'm working on doctor Who's 60th anniversary uh yes this is work apparently and uh, and so she came for supper to, to my house and that's where she recorded that message so um uh, when you saw her on bbc breakfast she had been fed at haydoke towers the night before and uh, and so that's when i managed to get her as the uh, the, the, the the final piece of the jigsaw of uh, of those greetings that you've heard so far will there be more will i succeed in my task of getting you uh, a classic companion to cover each doctor's era that's what I thought would be nice to get greetings wise. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to have much luck with the, the new series because that's all swanky and fine. They, you know, they live in different environments. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'll try with the classic series. I thought that was a good task to set myself. But this, you know, this doesn't need post credits, uh, frankly, this podcast. 
it's already quite long enough. I have just watched the uh, the, the the adventure in space and time though, uh, and even though I'm in it, uh, it was quite surprising to me because I didn't know what was going to happen at the end. I'm not going to spoil it just in case uh, you haven't seen it yet. But it's worth it if you think, oh, I've seen it. Watch the BBC Four viewing. Um, and wasn't it nice that Ben Cook was on uh, was on this very podcast and. Uh, and his name, you know, was prominent on the credits of the Coloured Daleks. That has just been shown. Uh, and I've just, you know, had a break from all of this work, in inverted commas, uh, to enjoy that as well. Oh, it's a good time to be a Doctor Who fan. <laughs>